For most people, the subject of Sasquatch is little more than a novelty. But try asking one of the many thousands of credible people who have seen the creature, and it's anything but. Imagine seeing something and learning of its existence for the first time, knowing that no one will believe you, because you wouldn't have believed it yourself. But just because it's hard to believe, doesn't mean it isn't true. Our mission is the same as it's always been, to contribute as much as we can to the public awareness of these creatures. So if and when even the most physically capable and mentally proficient of people encounter one of these beings, they aren't left with the lasting emotional and mental trauma that is too often the norm after an encounter. I only speak from my own experience. We put together a dedicated team of people from many walks of life to spend 168 consecutive hours in the South Florida woods in the hope of collecting direct evidence that the existence of Sasquatch is more than just a myth or the boogeyman in some creepy tale, and that people who frequent any woods will pay attention to the possibility that these amazing and reclusive creatures we call Sasquatch do inhabit the forests of North America. First things first. This is a Florida Sasquatch. The image was captured by Mark Zasky from Crypto Reality just over a mile from our camp. Now, I'm not ambitious enough to think that I can change anyone's mind about the existence of these beings, and for the most part, people don't take action until it becomes personal. So whether you believe in any of this, there are people who see this subject through a prism of their own fear because they've seen what you are looking at in person. All I ask is that you be respectful of them. This creature is looking straight at the camera. He has an apex head, and on the right side of the circle, you can see its left hand on the tree. You can even make out the thumbnail. 600 frames later, it did something they rarely do when people are around. It moved. You can see it removed its hand from the tree and turned its head just slightly. It's sitting about 60 yards away under the darkest canopy in the woods. You are not going to see it with your naked eye and it probably knows that. But we use cameras that let in a lot of light and that removes much of the shadow so Mark was able to catch it on camera moving. There appears to be another one to the right between him and the tree, but it's just too hard to tell. This is one of my favorite clips from Crypto Reality. Melanie's ass he's filming right now, and to me, this is unprecedented. I don't think I've ever seen anything quite this good, and you'll see why in just a moment. But if you'll look between those palm fronds, there's a dark circle in there, a dark hole. There's a face sitting in that hole. It's very chimpanzee looking, hooded nose like us, long prognathic upper lip, uh, very pronounced brow. If you couldn't see it before, there's a circle for you. But it does something else, something you wouldn't expect and most people are not going to catch. It blinks. Now again, this creature is probably supremely confident that the two people on the other side of that bank cannot see him. In fact, they can't. They didn't catch this until they got home and was able to see what the camera had picked up. But how amazing is that? This is not CGI. That is an actual, believe it to be a very large male Sasquatch. They heard these creatures walk up and they could smell them as well. My best guess, he's sitting there waiting for Mark to start throwing apples. And you can bet he is not alone. Someone might say, well, that's just an escaped chimpanzee. Well, chimpanzees don't have hooded noses or massive eyes like this being that's in the woods. There's that one deep in thoughts of the universe. These beings seem to always be hiding even in the dark, and not just from us, but from everything. And that only seems self-evident because they're so good at it. 
In fact, they've adapted so well to it that we can't get a good enough image of one to even prove they're out there. Most of the images you'll see captured in this area, the skin appears green or black. Now the three possibilities I can think of for this, one being chromatophores like a squid or a lizard, two, it's something they put on their skin, or three, which I think is more likely, it's reflecting the color of the foliage. You'll see throughout this film skin variations from light gray to black and everywhere in between. This is not Jack Link Sasquatch. What I and many others have seen and what has been captured on camera in this area is more like a caveman. The creature you see here is obviously black, but for all these reasons, skin tone, hair, and mostly behavior, they're all but impossible to study. You're likely to never get much more than this right here. Mark Zasky, who helped direct the field effort for this film, and his wife Melanie, have gotten as close as anyone ever has. Yes, we can listen to anecdotes and determine what we can about an individual or a group, but what these beings are and what's right or wrong when it comes to how we treat or react to them is never clear. The best we can do is make sure it's coming from the right place and error on the side of caution when we're in their environments. This, of course, is my opinion. I'm a retired real estate executive. I came, my background was real estate finance, acquisitions, portfolios, etc. No, I'm definitely a believer. You know, I, I, I don't need to be convinced about it. I've seen it, you know, I was young. But then I've also had certain things that have happened that I couldn't explain until later in life when YouTube channels started coming out, when people started talking about their experiences, when I heard very, very different audios. And, I would, and all of a sudden I would be like, oh my God, I've, I've heard that before. Then it would start correlating with other things that I could not imagine or I couldn't understand, but now I do understand. Family man, just like anybody else uh, working nine to five. My family's very supportive of this because of my own experiences and encounters that I've had. Um, so they know that it strikes a chord with me and um, it's pretty. I need to be pretty passionate about it. Um, I have been actively researching Bigfoot for around eight years and I am from West Tennessee. We mainly research in LBL, Land Between the Lakes, but I have also researched for uh, in 15 states everywhere from Florida to New Mexico. and. This is what I enjoy doing, is taking things that I learn in my own research area and see if I can apply them to different areas. Well, like I said, I used to be a personal trainer, so I was always very familiar with uh, biomechanics and kinesiology. And so, you know, when I was younger and I originally saw the Patterson Gimlin film, you know, I was always able to look at people walking and be able to tell them what exercises they need to do to correct their posture and, and just, you know, tell about biomechanics, what they need to work on and everything. So when I saw the movement in the Patterson Kimmel film, I could just tell it wasn't a person in a suit. I mean, just the way they walked. You know, a person can mimic the knee bends and the stride and the arm swings and everything, but they can't do it that fluid and that naturally and you can just tell it's, it's not a human being. I've been um, pursuing this subject and being a student of the Sasquatch species for 15 years, ever since I started going on expeditions with the BFRO, and I got completely um, bitten by the, by the bug back then, and I've basically devoted my life to this um, inquiry ever since then. After a couple of years of going on expeditions all over North America, where there uh, was a long history of sightings, my grandparents talked to me about it, both sides talked about it when I was younger. Um, so I had a little bit of a background on it, although never at the time seeing one, hearing one kind of, you know, you still wonder. Uh, but as the years progressed, it was just something that never really, it was something that was always in the back of my mind. Anytime I would see anything on TV or, uh, you know, it could be anything that, that, uh, that had anything to do with the subject, it would always bring those those memories back up. Um, and, 
probably eight to ten years ago really got into it serious like really trying to really trying to learn two or three years after the beginning really starting to try to get out in the field as much as I could and meet who I could. My grandmother had uh, an encounter or I would like to say an encounter in uh, Mississippi years and years ago uh, growing up that uh, sounds pretty Bigfoot-ish to me so that got me interested and I've always been interested in cryptids and uh, any kind of paranormal story. As a little kid it was just the monsters in general, you know, Godzilla, King Kong, and then reading um, stories and stuff from ghosts and UFOs and all that, and then Bigfoot. Bigfoot was always my favorite. It was my my number one thing I loved, and gorillas were the number one animal I loved, so uh, I just studied up and read and finally started having encounters and took off. Um, I've always kind of been into alternative ideas and not always taking the mainstream narrative as gospel. Um, I've always liked to find answers for myself, and so I've always kind of been into the esoteric and the conspiracy theories, but I hadn't really gotten as close to what I thought was answers, and so I made the switch to Bigfoot because I felt like I could, you know, get close to it. It was something that I could smell, it was something that I'd be able to see and interact with. I worked for uh, one of the very large three-letter agencies. Um, I was a senior special agent, digital forensics agent, and computer forensics agent as well. Um, so I worked a lot of cyber cases and stuff and had done a, quite a bit of stuff with technology. Um, in addition to that, um, I, right out of graduate school, had uh, taught college criminal justice, uh, ran a criminal justice department at a college for three years prior to going back into federal law enforcement, a few, a few instances. Uh, one in 2017 uh, when I was camping and I would go hiking when I retired. I'd go hiking up in northern Michigan and in the woods and go on night hikes alone and things like that. I believe my, uh, I know my first experience is what really got me into it uh, and I was, it was actually with my father and my brother when we were backpacking in, uh, in Sam Houston uh, National Forest in Texas. And uh, uh, that experience is what really put me on the on the trail of wanting, wanting to do my research. And We're also joined by local independent researcher Mike Velez, independent researcher from Michigan Chad Datema, local independent researcher Russell Van Zylen, local independent researcher Stephanie Perez, aka Stevie B, from Georgia tracker and security specialist Jeff Townsend. Local independent researcher Bobby White. And directing the teams in the field, local research group Crypto Reality, Mark and Melanie Zasky. On arrival night, before we started the clock, our close friend and independent researcher Mark Kinchell from South Carolina got a call that his mother had fallen and wasn't doing so well. So he packed up and drove back to see about her. She passed away four days later. We hold Mark in very high regard, and his efforts were certainly missed. Our thoughts and prayers go out to him and his family. The first night, Mark Zasky from Crypto Reality started us off with a little of what to expect. The most important thing to understand about what's in that drawing is that it's embedded in a way that you cannot comprehend in this environment. This thing will dig a hole four feet deep with the water table two feet down and lay in it and feel comfortable. There is no joke about this. This is harm's way time, okay? This is pay attention. Um, you may be looking for a Sasquatch and get bit by a water monster around the campsite. Watch the trees. If you've got good zoom on your equipment, start zooming. When the sun comes up, start zooming. Watch these trees in the tops. You're going to be looking for the darkest possible areas. And what you'll see if they're in there is an unnatural color. Blur with a hominoid face. Their hair breaks it all up. This is one of the reasons why out of this entire crowd of people, 
no one got a really good look except the guy that was three feet from him. Right? The very nature of the creature and its physical adaptations allow it to just sit there and you will walk by it. It doesn't even have to try to hide. I have walked by these things and heard a sound and turned around and saw and seen them. There's a lot of things that we've been through in the field, my wife and I. But for now, what, what, I wanna, what I want you guys to understand is that what is in here is watching. It is watching, man. Get out for the first time? Well, we're, we're going to go out. We're going to go to an area that Stevie B reconned about three weeks ago and found some possible signs, maybe some corridors running through there. So we're going to we're going to go there first and check it out. Heading out to that first location on the first day, I think tensions were a little bit high, just not really knowing what to expect. Just heading into an area that we thought was going to be viable, uh, it seemed pretty evident that the heat was going to be a real factor. The team came across something that appeared to be a blind. I mean, if I were going to hide to observe something, this is probably where I would do it. Examining further, they found what appeared to be a track. Uh, it's hard to know for sure, but it was definitely worth looking at. This little spot right here, it seems to be cleared out. There is a trail that leads into here and they can go low and sit low and sit here and, and observe this field for any type of animal such as hog or deer that might The team came across two trees that appeared to be pushed down, but they were still green and growing. If you look at this one up here, I'm looking for straight lines. Mm -hmm. Then we find this one. I'm and point then we point. look right in there, and we have an animal trail going right through there. This is something that I have noticed, is if you find a piece of evidence, you want to find the second piece of evidence, and it will give you an idea of the travel route that they could be using. And so that's really important to try to put these little signs together and where they lead to. We don't know if they're going or if they're coming, but it does appear that we have a possible booger trail that would come out. Now, if I wanted to look, I will take this marker and that marker, and we can go back and see if we can find another sign. A few hundred yards from there, Mark and Melanie were walking through when they heard something large moving through the brush. As they made their way toward the action, they came across these two tracks. These tracks are from two separate individuals. The one on the right is 14 and a half inches and the other is 17 inches long. It's the only tracks they could find, but also the only substrate in the area suitable for leaving a clear track. By the time they made it back to the tracks to get decent footage, it was dark. But before that, while they were filming around the track area, they happened to catch this being peeking over the brush at them. They didn't see it, so they didn't have the camera on it very long, but still managed to catch three clear frames of the being. Its height is estimated to be around nine feet. If you haven't noticed, most of the images of these creatures captured in this area, the skin appears green. We've come to determine this as a result of diffusion. The being's skin is actually gray. Light reflects off the foliage and projects onto the gray skin of the being, making it appear green. We believe it's a natural adaptation, creating a perfect camouflage. You can see this effect on other animals with the same achromatic aberration, like these two capuchin monkeys. Don't they look happy? It seems the brighter the sun, the greener the skin appears. 
In the book, The Florida Keys Skunk Ape Files, author Brad Bertelli details interactions with skunk apes as far back as the early 1800s. Key West, like every island in the chain, was once covered in a natural hammock. A hammock is what woods or forests are called in South Florida and subtropical islands like the Keys. As the islands were settled during the 19th century, some were cleared to make room for the needs of the growing communities. Because of Key West's favorable location along the shipping channels and its natural deep harbor, a rarity along the archipelago, it was the first of the Keys to be widely settled. The early military presence likely bolstered the earliest residents' sense of security. Still, Key West was isolated, an outpost where stories of Indians and pirates were once passed around like a basket of bread at the dinner table. What has become clear is that the residents of Key West were not living on the island concern-free. From time to time, a sense of quiet unease would settle over the island. That silence would be punctuated by knocking noises in the trees, large shadows moving behind them, and a peculiar skunky smell. As the outpost grew into a community, so did the stories of a creature that sometimes crept through the hammocks on the outskirts of town. Around the waterfront, when Spanish sailors sailed into the harbor and that skunky aroma drifted in on the breeze, they would talk in hushed tones about La Bestia and stay close to their boats at night. In 1836, during the early years of the second escalation of the Seminole War, the U.S. schooner Constellation arrived at Key West. It remained in port for a month. During that time, the midshipmen and other sailors worked with local citizens to clear away sections of the island's hammocks. The work was done for these primary reasons. First, clearing the island of the trees and other brush allowed the ocean breezes to more easily blow across the island. Without formal mosquito control measures in place, Natural remedies like breezes help to keep the clouds of bugs at bay, if even just a little. Second, additional usable space was created for residential and commercial properties to expand across the island. Lastly, the less discussed reason behind the island's clearing was that it had been done, at least in part, as a concerted effort to deter the appearance of the cryptid. The farther back the tree line was cut, the farther back the creatures that would occasionally appear on the island seemed to stay away, and the fewer stories were being told about them. Strange occurrences, however, would not altogether cease to occur. Carries Fort Reef is located off the coast of the largest of the Florida Keys, Key Largo. It can be found more than 100 miles north of Key West and is a large and dangerous reef. Historically, statistically speaking, it proved to be the single most dangerous tract of coral in all of the thousand of individual structures making up the Florida Reef. Before the Carries Fort Lighthouse was constructed to mark the reef in 1852, Captain John Walton spent more than a dozen years in charge of government lightships stationed at a convenient anchorage nearby called Turtle Harbor. The lightship, located a handful of miles off the coast of North Key Largo, first dropped anchor in 1824. What Walton realized relatively early on in his tenure as captain was that the government deliveries of food staples and stores for his men were not reliable. To better provide for his crew, Walton established a garden at a Key Largo cove where he farmed tomatoes, melons, limes, and other fruits and vegetables. In a log entry dated August 28, 1829, Walton wrote, Unusual occurrence at garden site, accompanied by strong skunky odor. When our party approached, we heard a thrashing in the hammocks, as if a large animal had been surprised. As we entered the garden area, it was in disarray, with several unusually large footprints left in the soil. The largest man amongst us placed his boot inside one of the tracks, and it appeared as an infant's by comparison. 
as our group stood remarking on the unusual sight. First one melon and then another came flying out of the brush. Landing at our feet, the melons exploded. One, two, three. The impact sprayed up with both pulp and seed. It was as if they had been hurled at us, which as I remember the event, they were. The melon incident was followed by prolonged silence. As we were without arms, we departed the garden area, and it was determined that from that point forward, all visits to the island would be accompanied by arms. Just a few hours in, and some of the team began feeling ill. Uh, it became evident that we were going to be no match for the South Florida heat and would be better taking our chances once the sun went down. The area we had planned the coming night expedition is where this image was captured. It was taken by local independent researcher Richard Borchardt. Now I've heard people say, if you have to circle it, then it's not good enough. People take clear pictures of themselves all the time. If Sasquatch exists, then we should be getting clear images and not the blurry pics we usually see. That's probably one of the more ignorant statements I've heard, because what I've come to realize about showing someone an image and telling them it's Sasquatch is that they seem to predetermine what they're looking for before they see it. People have been shown so many blurry pictures of what's been claimed to be Sasquatch that they're missing what's clear in the image sometimes. I'd equate it to hearing a language you don't know. It just sounds like gibberish until you learn how to associate each sound, word, or phoneme properly. It's the same with looking for a Sasquatch in an image. Until you learn what to look for, you're probably only going to see what you're used to seeing. Blurry, off-kilter faces that are not symmetrical and looking in some direction that's not close to where you are. I'd say no less than 99% of the clear images I've seen, the creature is hiding very well with the camouflage to help them and looking at the camera. That's the behavior we've noticed more than anything. What I look for is what I've seen in person, looking for a particular bone structure coupled with symmetry and in most we've seen an apex or cone shaped head. In every image you'll see in this film, you'll be able to see all three of these characteristics in each one. Cone head, bone structure, facial symmetry, and in about 99% of them, looking at the person holding the camera. Just about every time I show someone this image, they say, yeah, I see it, it's right here. Completely gazing over the being sitting right here with all three of the criteria I just mentioned. Now, you can't fault anyone for missing it. I certainly never do. It's the conditioning we've all been given from the first time we hear and understand the words Bigfoot or Sasquatch to look for a Harry and the Hendersons or Jack Link's messing with Sasquatch type creature. And that's not to say there aren't beings out there that look like them, but to our experience in areas like this and others across the North American continent, their appearance is much more human, and I think that's one of the real problems science has with validating such a creature. The very nature of the creature makes that a mountainous task regardless, but it's much easier going along to get along than it is to buck the established order of things. But that's not what we care about. We don't care if you believe in any of this. But by showing you what thousands of people have seen and what we look for, our hope is that you will pay attention to the possibility when you're in any woods. Not that you should be afraid to go camping or hiking or taking a stroll down by the lake. We just don't know enough about them to truly trust they will do nothing more than watch or follow us. And being aware might save you from the shock and mental stress that the sudden moment of realization has been known to cause. After deciding on the area for the first night expedition, all the teams decided they'd hit the trail just so everyone could get a feel for the place and each other. The plan of attack was for the groups to split into two teams and go in from different angles, then meet in the middle where the trail comes together. Yeah, you're going to go straight to the crossroads. 
and then you're gonna stop and wait for us. Don't go any deeper in. Deeper in mm -hmm. means you're in where we've planned on going tonight to record them. That's where they stay, that's where they sleep. Stay at the crossroads and we'll be there. No one got off trail, but glassing with thermal and night vision from the trail did prove to be somewhat productive. Blake Deutscher from the Lost Cryptids Conservatory was using a Psionics color night vision camera and happened to catch this red eye shine only 15 feet away. It appeared to be over eight feet off the ground. Now, I've hunted for a long time and shined many animals' eyes, but have never seen any with red eye shine. Not much else was captured here, but what was captured back in the tree line by our camp was some very strange and interesting audio. Christopher Noel had placed a recorder in the tree line about 200 yards from our camp that first day. What was captured sounds like nothing I've ever heard before. This is the only night anything like this was recorded, but I believe it's because it's the only night no one was left at camp. This is what he recorded. But I do want to get in this area and I want to track tomorrow and then tomorrow night I want to come attack this area again once we get a better idea of which section they're using. The activity will be real obvious it's going to be on the ground. You're going to find it. If it's there it, you will find it. It is that simple. We're going to track uh, south and we're going to track east, southeast. Um, I want to have a couple people tracking this way but not too deep because they do live back there in the Okamik. So we're going to get in here tomorrow. Uh, what tomorrow will compromise is a lot of looking down at the ground. Mm -hmm. When you find tracks, begin filming immediately, not just the tracks. One person documenting the tracks and cameras rolling all around you. Here are some of the tracks found in this area by Mark and Melanie. You know, bringing awareness is huge, huge. And so, you know, I, I have a lot of respect for people who bring awareness to the Sasquatch subject, you know. Um, I think it's unfortunate that more powerful people are trying to 
bring awareness to the Sasquatch subject in ways that would promote a more intelligent understanding in the average American's consciousness about the fact that these things are out there. You know, I think that a, a couple thousand years of history um, that is now being brought into question puts us in a perfect time to have this discussion finally, you know, and a serious one. A more serious dialogue, you know. Um, having been on this side of the equation for as long as we have, I think that um, you know there's a certain amount of what we were doing that we're no longer willing to do. What we want to do is move to make change in America where this subject is concerned. I think they're the true hide and seek champions. I think they're very inquisitive. They want to know what you're doing. You know, they're the ultimate woodsman. They they know how to hide in plain sight. Like, for instance, the Native Americans on the prairie, when the cavalry would be chasing them, sometimes they would just hide in a, a short, you know, indention in the ground where it was in plain sight, but it was in such plain sight that you weren't looking for something at such plain sight. I believe the whole premise of the way these creatures behave is they have to stay hidden in order for their survival. Uh, they have to observe us in order to know if they're staying hidden or not. Uh, they also probably need to know what we're doing at all times when we're in their area so they can retreat if they need to, be aggressive if they need to, and kind of stand their ground for their home. Uh, they are the people of the forest and stuff, you know, elder tribes or elder brother. Uh, guardian of the forest. Many natives have different terms for them, so I believe they are a people from my experience of being yelled at especially. It was very human-like. Shy but curious. Very, you know, shy, shy on the, in the, on the aspect of, you know, the, the constantly hiding, the constantly trying to stay out of sight, but yet curious enough always to be just close enough to to be able to tell what's going on uh, and and checking out what you know different you know what people are doing um, in their areas, uh, but definitely shy but curious, very curious. It seems like. In my opinion, they don't want to have anything to do with us. Um, in my opinion, they have their life, and they don't they don't want anything. They don't need anything from us. They don't need our protection. They don't need our they don't need anything from us and that's that's very that can be very hurtful to the to the human ego uh, well because we think that the bears need us and the deer need us and every everything out there needs us to protect them right but then we learn that there's something out there that doesn't need our protection and that is actually that we might need to be protected from well let me just say in my opinion these creatures spend their whole lives trying to avoid humans and they are good at it and I also feel like they're curious animals so they will come around and they will want to see what the humans are doing but it is they're just not going to step out and for you to be able to take pictures they're always in hiding mode I think one of the biggest difficulties of catching these creatures on camera has been the technology. I think technology is just now becoming affordable and accessible enough for the average person to be able to acquire them and go out in the field on a consistent basis. And it's, it's gonna take time out in the field and it's gonna take good technology to be able to capture evidence. And I just think it's, you know, thermals are just now becoming affordable enough for people to rent or buy and go out in the field. I think they're drawn to us like we're drawn to them because they don't simply avoid us like the plague. They avoid us like the plague and they also, there's a flip side to the same coin. They also come around our, our houses. They come around and they slap the side of houses. They like mess with us. They mimic our voices. They try to like pull pranks on us. They, they, they steal our belongings. They rearrange things. A friend of mine had her garden hole put 60 feet up in a tree, she found it. And she'd been seeing the Sasquatch around, mostly at night. Um, and so what else is going to put her hoe 50, 60 feet up in a tree? Um, so I think they, they simultaneously um, 
need to be distant from us and they want to communicate with us but only indirectly only through mediation like through objects or through middle of the night uh, pebbles on the roof or tapping on the glass of our windows uh, there's never a direct hardly ever a direct encounter with with uh, with our cousins because they do have hair that that breaks up a uh, very specific impression of what a body would be it kind of diffuses the outline of the body so I believe that helps with them I believe that the coloring of them the drab coloring of either uh, uh, barks or the reds the deep rust reds that you see in palms or in leaves I believe their coloring helps to hide them I believe the oil on their skin reflects the colors back I believe that the hair that I've seen uh, that seems somewhat clear and has like a prism type effect. I think all of this kind of comes together to make a perfect camouflage system for a creature that's just smart enough to stay out of range and maintain their survival without giving themselves up. Because they could really, if they wanted to, they could decimate us. I think what Melanie and I did was refuse to ignore what everyone else did to ignoring. I think that there are a lot of people that know what's going on, that work in these areas, and they're ignoring it. And they're, they're just, they're not reporting. I mean, over the last couple of years, I've been contacted on three occasions by officers that have retired or have stepped out of that and have told me that you know, they know what's going on, but what are they supposed to do about it? Lose their retirement? Which kind of tells me that they're under threat. You know? Like, they fear, at least, they fear being somebody to step out and say, hey, this is important. We're finding these, you know, huge tracks. These are like living creatures that are leaving tracks. And you're like, why? You know, nobody wants to be that guy. Is, is what's you know self-evident and anyone can see that because these things are definitely out there and you know if it's like when I look around I think that that's more about what it's about than because I think people know I think there are a lot of people who know I think if you go into rural America you'll find thousands of people who know these things are there who are not being listened to period and they're not being listened to by arrogant human beings, which really, in this day and age, shouldn't jive, if you think about it, especially something this important, you know. I think John Q probably thinks that the average Bigfoot eyewitness is some hokey-pokey country boy who doesn't know his head from his ass, and that's simply not the case. That's simply not the case. There are people from all walks of life. There are, every demographic is represented in this catalog of eyewitnesses who've seen these hominoids out there, that they're real. To us, when, when I look around, I see denial, I see fear, I see a lack of courage in the face of the truth. In a, in a truth that could potentially aid in changing this disastrous consciousness that seems to be destroying our country and our planet. You know, I look at the situation and it's like, you know, recognizing that we share our planet with what ultimately could be where we came from, our ancestors, and, and we're acting like they're not even real when there are thousands of people who've seen them from every walk of life. Here are two more excerpts from the book, The Florida Key Skunk Ape Files, by author Brad Bertelli. The cove where James Egan had piloted Audubon in hopes of seeing a flamingo was familiar, and one to which Egan had taken Audubon for the very purpose of securing a flamingo for his studies. The cove was not unfamiliar to Egan just because it had proven to be attractive to flamingos. It was also a place where he had previously encountered the cryptid, and one he seemed compelled to return to in the weeks and months that followed his experience with Audubon. 
A second letter penned by Egan, also written to his brother, provides additional background into the days that followed the encounter. In the letter, James wrote, in part, At first, there was a tremendous smell, one I had smelled several times prior, a powerful odor, like a hundred wet dogs. There was no crashing through the mangroves, nor the breaking of the tree limbs, as if something were scrambling to escape. This time, it was the opposite. There was no sound at all. It was a heavy quiet, and the hairs on the back of my neck stood up. I paddled around the mangroves, and there, back in the root tangle, was that same massive creature that was not quite ape and not quite man. It was covered in fur, except around his face and chest, and it was big, bigger, and built powerfully like those black bears that came around the Miami River. I raised my rifle to shoot, but I did not fire and cannot say exactly why. I saw its eyes. We looked at each other, and when we did, I lowered my rifle. It turned its back to me. With one step, and then two, it disappeared into the hammock. I was so unnerved by the power of its gaze. It was like my finger had been frozen on the trigger. I did fire as it walked away, almost unintentionally. But the muzzle of my rifle had dropped, and the ball struck the water with a hollow thud. While I have been by that point since, and have done so just to settle my curiosity, I have not again seen the creature. Neither have I felt the heavy silence so completely devoid of life. The peculiar smell, that very distinct odor, however, has been noted on several occasions. History records Juan Ponce de Leon as the first European to chart the Florida Keys. Although the archipelago appears on several maps predating his 1513 arrival, Ponce labeled the island chain Los Materias, perhaps because, as some history books suggest, the low-lying islands covered in bleached limestone and ringed by the red mangroves' twisted gnarled roots projected a tortured appearance. However, another lesser-known story proffers an alternative reason for his choice. Ponce de Leon dubbed the islands he found some 70 miles southwest of present-day Key West Las Tortugas, due to the area's considerable turtle population. In time, the islands would be known as the Dry Tortugas, a designation owed to their lack of fresh water. Although the explorer and his expedition are known to have visited the Dry Tortugas, they seem to have steered clear of the rest of the island chain. Stories passed around in some shadowy history circles argue the reason he chose the name Las Matires was not for the reason taught in history books because the sailors surrounding him refused to go ashore at the islands north of Cayo Eso, Key West. Notes documenting auxiliary expeditions into Key West and surrounding islands record several anomalies inconsistent with official records. Including these were references to creatures of unusual size. Crewmen, influenced by these word-of-mouth accounts, began refusing to go ashore for fear of La Bestia. Indeed, it is possible that Ponce de Leon chose the name Los Martires not because of the island chain's tortured appearance, but rather his reaction to the stories passed between the men surrounding him. Day 2. The team discovered evidence that a visitor had been very close the night before. Researcher Josh Parsons came across a track in the sand about 50 feet from camp that hadn't been there the day before. We were back there looking for hair on the, on the barbed wire or tracks because uh, a few of the other members in the group uh, were uh, experiencing some strange things. So uh, Mark took us back there to check it out. And, um, uh, we saw back there what, look, what looked like small footprints, uh, wasn't anything definite, uh, it, it did look strange. And we were heading back towards where we were staying. And I was looking on the ground and I happened to see this track. And 
when I saw this, it it caught me off guard for a minute. It took me a minute to process because it's just this one track, just sitting in this in this pile of sand, or not pile of sand, but in this sand trail uh, that goes back to where we're staying. And I ended up calling Mark back and saying, "Take a look at this." And Mark was like, "Yeah, that is a print." And so at that point, we decided to cast it. Um, so of course, we we went through the process of casting this, and uh, we ended up uh, keeping it overnight and uh, pulling it the next morning, and it came out really, really nice. For the cast over there, um, we had done a um, plaster cast of it in a box in a form uh, so we could make it thick enough so that it would be robust enough to resist cracking or uh, um, uh, breaking in half when we pulled it out so we did we got underneath very lucky for us here in Florida we have sand um, sand everywhere so basically what we did was excavate the sand from underneath the cast and then we lifted the cast out um, we had some we had some roots and bulbs in the cast itself and I was concerned that a corner of the cast could break off. Um, but we got it out, we lifted it out in one unit, one piece, supporting not only either end, but uh, the middle as well. Uh, what we did then, we had grass and mud and dirt on it. Uh, we ran it on uh, underwater over there a little bit, gentle, gentle water on it to remove the dirt, the dust. Um, and we have trimmed it. We've trimmed the roots back, the roots that were in danger of cracking it. And uh, so now we have a much more pristine uh, footprint. And you can see in the front of the print is it's like 15 inches long and I'll show you in a second. Um, but you can see in the front of the foot, it appears to be like a right, a right foot impressed in the ground with a lot of weight. Um, but you can see um, they the, the front and the back of the foot arch and they kind of meet in the center um, at an angle, which would be the mid-tarsal break that we look for that humans don't have on their feet. And, and then, of course, you can see the heel and toes. Once the track was taken care of, Mark Newbill took a team to an area where a lot of activity had been documented. Have a drop box set out, a Zoom recorder, we're going to go change the batteries out and we're going to continue on this service road that's closed to the public. This right here is what I would consider a booger trail. Uh, it's higher up where things have been broken off. It's not like deer have ran through here and brushed up against things and broken it. The, the brakes that are in there are higher up. And you can also see where it comes through. There's one that's right here. And then there's a little smaller right here for probably smaller animals. And it goes in, it cuts back to the right and back to the left. And that pretty much goes straight back in there. Yeah, most stuff I can see that. So we'll find them all over the place. I'm just, I'm just looking at all these trails. If you were a deer hunter, now this is the place where you would want to put your stand in it opens up you got a trail over here a trail over here a smaller one right here and one over here and all all these trails come in together and so you have an opportunity to be able to capture more audio with all these trails conveying into this one particular area and if Animals like raccoons and possums and deer and boar are using this. I would say the boogers would be too. Now, this drop box 
would not fool a booger in my opinion but it may fool somebody that's hiking and camoed up enough it's right there you see the dead cat coming out of the bottom you you're just not going to be able to trick one of these i mean you're in their house yeah, but the boogers are pretty good at about knowing anything that's yeah, not natural. We don't know if they're hearing the batteries. We don't know. Yeah. Uh, you know what what it could be. It could be the smell of the alka alkaline. Yeah. You know. Probably a couple of different things. But there was one guy that was putting them in these boxes and burying the boxes. Yeah. But I he, know Kane Michael has done that. And so we got the zoom uh, deployed again and probably me and Shelly Reed and Larry Porch will be reviewing the audio and when we review the audio it's second by second if this thing if we get 48 hours of audio the reviewer will listen second by second for those 48 hours and that's usually what we do is we break up the times give one person 24 hours another person 24 hours another person 24 hours and a good audio reviewer will want to see these video clips of the area where the recorder was dropped off that way they can paint a picture in their mind when they go into that bubble of listening and to know just the ambient sounds and the difference in between if something is starting to move in here. And to be listening for vocalizations, tree knocks, or anything like that over, the dis over a distance, you will be surprised at how good this microphone is. This airplane that's flying over right now, you it will sound like it's a, a thousand feet off the ground flying by. The microphones are really good. There's four microphones on here that record in stereo. You can actually put on a pair of headphones and review this. And if something comes from the east to the west, they will know what direction it came from. And I will have to uh, give everyone that's reviewing this audio where on the compass this thing was faced. that yeah not sure what it was uh, the wind did pick up and blow yeah you're right. and it could have been a limb or something that was hung up in a tree all right I'll you when I see stuff like this this definitely looks like a booger trail coming through here. How would this snap towards the bottom going across this trail and nothing else is damaged here? No. Is none it, of that bamboo. Is it a nothing. You yeah. see how it snapped down there? Oh, uh, it's There's a lot of hog activity back there. Yeah. Okay. But how it happened and didn't damage anything else here. Yeah. Is is a little bit peculiar. 
and just something that that you want to note as far as possible activity mm -hmm. so you can see that trail real oh good. yeah that's that's Look definitely true right here where it comes and it does a little elbow i'm gonna just check this yeah. out okay. Oh, humongous spider web. I think this area is a fruitful place to come in here and research. We have found quite a bit of possible Bigfoot activity moving in and out of here. Over here, you see we've got a large field. And I can see just from right here without walking over there, there's at least two pretty good sized trails that come into this area. And this is one of those areas that I like to bring a thermal to at night. And just you could just set up here and just glass all of this area to see if you can because where you have this like these openings and these trails coming out to this field they are this place is just dotted all around and if you're able to set up here with the thermal and look for hits of any animals that would be wanting to to come across this field or get off in there and, and hide and wait for something to come across. It's so hot and humid during the day right now. It, we might not have too much movement and activity going on during the day. I'm sure they're probably laying low in creek beds and near water and chilling in the shade, but it'd definitely be an interesting place to come in at nighttime, especially with thermal imagers and see if we can get some activity especially scanning the tree line of these catchment fields. Yeah. See if you can get anything hiding right on the other side of the tree line. I mean, you see how close that print was yeah. that we captured. Yeah. And it was uh, to, to camp. I mean, it was rock throwing distance from tents. Chris, mm -hmm. Christopher Noel and Bradley Hatcher, I actually had walked out there because I was thinking, oh, well, there's a booger wouldn't be right here while we're sitting here. They saw eyeshine right there. They were directing me towards it. Yeah. I mean, I I figured I'd see some possum or raccoon scurry off, but no. Yeah. Knowing that that print was right there, that very yeah. well could have been Cornelius right then and there, like yeah. putting that print there. Yeah. You could uh, have have you a little fire and sit out here and, and cook some bacon and get those smells moving mm -hmm. moving around here, and I I really feel like that they are curious animals. And when they've got a full belly and they're content, we're their TV, we're their entertainment. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, that's just a theory, but that's my theory. Yeah, it's definitely very hot right now. Yeah. With the heat during the day, no other teams made it out, and Mark was just collecting his recorder and scouting with Clay, Blake, Josh, and Todd. Not much was captured on the recorder, except one possible distant knock. Myself and Mark Zasky were in this area a few years before, when he captured this creature on camera. We looked for the original clip, but couldn't locate it. This is in 4K, and about as clear as you're going to get without them walking out of the brush on you. What I find most interesting and a bit perplexing is the difference in the way these beings look from one another. The bone structure appears to be the same, but their soft features are as diverse as ours are. This being was captured on camera less than 100 yards from the other, and you can plainly see they look nothing alike. I've shown people this image, and they say, yeah, I see the head and shoulders. And I reply, no, it's just a face. In this area, they just don't give you very much more than them poking their face through the brush to watch you. Mark and Melanie were standing in this creature's den, or so it appeared at the time, with it sitting 40 feet away in the bush watching them. The floor of the canopy they were under 
was completely clean of debris, no leaves, sticks, or dry palm fronds. You can assume it would make moving through there much quieter. Though this looks like your more traditional Sasquatch, the other is quite strange looking, in my opinion, with much larger lips, almond-shaped eyes, and appears to have a very low forehead, one of the few where you can't make out the cone, if it has one. But they're hanging out in close proximity of one another. I'm not sure what that implies, if they are related or just tolerant of each other. Either way, they are there, and they are extremely hard to catch on camera. I think this environment plays a big factor in how they do their routines and what their priorities are for family life, hunting, food, shelter. So the different times of the day with the different temperatures affects, I think, what they're doing. It's a, it's a good area and with the information that we have been given about these beings that are out here, we're in a prime location. Um, we're, we're at ground zero. I really think this area is one of the best areas in all of the United States. Just the environment, the way they're contained by natural barriers, the foliage, the constant temperature and climate pretty much year round. On top of you know what Zasky has been able to uncover in his research, I think this is one of the best places there are. I think this offers the best probability of capturing evidence and I don't think we could have come up with a better area. Um, here, in, in, on our, our expedition here in Florida, um, it's very different because we're taking a very active approach as a group to deploy and try to stir up an interaction rather than the passive approach I take, which is to simply to lie in the dark quietly and wait for them to uh, come upon me. This is where we're trying to, we're trying to come upon them. It's a whole other approach and we hope that it's going to be successful. Um, we know we're in the right place. The question is, are we going to um, find ourselves in a lucky position at the right time? That's the question, and we're, we're doing our best. It's so similar to where I'm from in Mississippi, but it's so different in, in other aspects. Just the, the foliage and the terrain, it's just, it's all, it's almost like, I feel like I'm 3,000 miles away from home. Uh, I think it's easier to find sign in the woods where I'm from than here. It's probably because of the, the amount of trees and the, the different varieties and so forth and what they have to work with. But uh, when you really ride these, these back roads and really get to look and you, you really, I mean, there's, there's just so much for them, so many places for them to be out here. So many, so many ways to, you know, for them to hide and stay out of sight as much as they want to. I uh, do believe that there are prehistoric canals. Well, I know there are prehistoric canals here in the state of Florida that go from the Atlantic to the Gulf side that were created by the Calusa and the Tequesta Indians. They have not been maintained in 400 years since they were eradicated. And I believe that the Bigfoot took this opportunity to go into these canals that grew up with lush vegetation. They always have that at the lowest point, they're below sea level, have a little bit of water, fresh water in them, the water table. So I think that it's historically, the historical significance and Bigfoot adapting to the environment and using those areas to their advantage. This I think connects to Sasquatch because I believe that the Sasquatch opportunistically use these prehistoric canal systems to their advantage to both maintain a cool body temperature to hide so that they can pounce out on prey and to just have access to water during dry seasons there there are creatures here there are creatures here um terry made a really good choice in coming here um zasky made a really good choice in recommending this place to us because there are creatures here um it I think that the creatures here are very, very used to concealing themselves, very, very used to the ebb and flow of traffic and where people do and usually do not go. And they know, because they've been studying for however long they've been here, how to, how to conceal themselves because they don't want to be exposed because they know that exposure equals death. I mean, that, that, that's the only thing that I can think of is that they that's the only thing that I can think of why they would keep themselves so concealed is just that they 
understand that that's pain and death. Night two had the team splitting up. Some would stay at camp and thermal the tree line because of the track and other activity the night before. David Todd and the Lost Cryptid team would head out to a known hotspot to do a separate investigation. Early on in the night, the camp team spotted something large in the tree line on the far edge of the field with the thermal cameras. That's about a 180-yard shot, and the tree is about 40 feet tall. Whatever that is, it's large. Jimmy, Josh, and a few of the others went out to try to get a better look. As soon as they got close, it vanished. They looked for a while, but nothing more was seen or heard. David and the Lost Cryptid team had a bit more eventful night. We rounded up everyone for a trip out there, and we were driving along the roadway. Uh, all of a sudden, Josh, Josh Parsons seen a red eye shine 10 feet up in the roadway, and uh, it basically turned and crossed the road. Uh, we all jumped out of the car as fast as we could, went into the woods, we started uh, hearing stuff, trying to follow it. Uh, we were tracking it as best we could, and basically uh, we were hearing a little bit of uh, twig snaps here and there. We were moving around through the brush, investigating, and uh, the team member members started seeing eye shine. I never seen the eye shine, but I fully trust these people with my life. I'm out here in the Florida swamps. Snakes, gators everywhere. I, I trust these people. They're seeing eye shine. It's it's ten feet up. It's eight feet up. It's up. It's up there, and it's moving. And we're we're going after it. Um, after a good number of minutes doing that, um, our buddy David uh, all of a sudden says, I, "I don't feel good." We went out to an area that was uh, not far from here, a few miles down the road. Uh, lots of wildlife, uh, alligators. Um, snakes, uh, spiders, uh, just, about, just about anything you can imagine. Um, was out there and we're out there after dark. We're out there actually very late at night and in the middle of nowhere, basically in the middle of Florida swamps. Um, so we did a night hike and we were uh, going through a lot of heavy brush. Um, on and during the hike, uh, as, as, as as far as uh, showing up on the hike, as soon as we got there, uh, Josh uh, immediately reported that he saw some eye shine in the uh, in the woods, and and we stopped immediately and get out, and then we heard uh, some rustling around twice, like there was something very large that had moved from that area uh, through the woods. So we kind of drove a little bit in, off of off of the main road down a service road and uh, we jumped out um immediately the brush got thick uh we were you know slogging through stuff um and at the beginning of at the beginning of our um second time that we were out of the car um we didn't really have too many incidents um we were hearing some owl hoots um but as we got to the end and we started to make our way back to the car that's when the kind of the peculiar thing started because we all got disoriented that was uncharacteristic of them to get turned around like that. Granted, we're in unfamiliar terrain and topography, but that was uncharacteristic. We were looking at maps the whole time, so it was. It started to get a little bit. Everyone started to get everyone's everyone's level of anxiety started to rise. Um, so we decided to go down a little bit farther and go into the woods. We tracked through the we tracked through the swamp. We tracked through the um, through the woods. We found a nice area. Um, where there was, uh, that was dug up as like a little pit where a larger animal could hide in. Um, that was very interesting. Um, we had also um, uh, just a very long hike, but on the way out, um, we had some trouble getting out. Um, and that trouble was uh, um, just really interesting. Um, I was uh, following the group. I was the last person in the group, and we're probably maybe a quarter mile still in. 
whenever I'm in, whenever I'm out in nature, I always, I, I don't take things joking around. If somebody says they're not feeling good, that, that to me is a serious thing because they could drop dead. Um, we could be a situation where we have to carry them out and not even four men could have carried him out of where we were. So that wasn't really an option. So it was, it was that my anxiety level went up. And so he says he's starting to feel ill and he's starting to lag behind. And uh, we're heading back to the car and I don't know what it was. I don't know what happened, um, but it was almost like I was put into a trance state um, where I started falling behind the group more and more and more and more um, to the point that I I tried I, I wanted to say hey hold up guys finally I was able to say hey hold up guys and they were way ahead of me um, but uh, I felt um, you know certainly not alone out there there's something out there and I, I think it was trying to lure me away from the group from the rest of the people, because uh, I was the last person. Um, so they came back, uh, Todd came back and Chad came back. Um, Todd uh, was gonna help me get back to the car and everything, and uh, he saw that I was a little bit uh, a little bit out of it. And I, I can tell you, you know, having been on the job as a policeman and everything in the summertime, you wear like vests, you wear a uniform, you wear gun belts, and a lot of weight to carry around but the vests are very um, they're very uh, heavy and hot in the summer and I have had a heat exhaustion before uh, on the job I know what it is and that's not what happened last night to me it was something that it was something that um, it, it basically put me in a trance and as I'm walking along so basically uh, I could um, uh, call to them they came back Todd had um, tried to lead me out of there. He had me by the shoulder, and he was trying to get me back to the car. Um, as we're going back to the car, um, Chad takes off. Then he takes off back towards the woods, just himself. And uh, everybody's like yelling for him to come back. He wouldn't come back. It's like something grabbed a hold of him too. Um, and he reported that he had seen uh, some eye shine in the woods that was up high above the bush that he looked at that dropped down from from uh, behind the bush we couldn't see it anymore and uh, he was prepared to go in after it and I was not going to leave Chad there um, and so Chad Todd and I were all there and I'm trying to pull away from Todd because uh, Chad wants to go in the root wants to go in the woods and I'm not going to uh, leave Chad do that alone. I think I told Todd, you know what, we came out here and this is what we came out here for, we're gonna do it. Um, ultimately, uh, we ended up uh, not going into the woods at night. Uh, they went back in the woods today to kind of scope it out and, and see if there was anything in that area that Chad had seen the eye shine um, after that happened to me. But Chad, uh, as well, he got lost he got misdirected um, in the woods, so something was just really weird. Chad doesn't get lost out there. He was completely turned around. So it seems as though whatever was happening was happening to the last person in the group. Um, because then he became the last person in the group, and it seems like whatever it was got a hold of him then. And we just had to gather ourselves uh, the best that we could and get out and for me it felt like um, uh, you know a, just a snap of a finger I went from uh, I went from feeling uh, like I was in a trance to wanting to throw up um, I was very sick to my stomach um, and and uh, I again this doesn't happen to me I've never had it happen on the trail before so it hit me hard and I was very much just out of it for a while and uh, we, Todd took film of it and we, we, we got out of there. Um, we planned to go back uh, tonight and uh, go back to the same area, same time and uh, see what we can find out. But uh, it was 
It was, it was a very interesting experience. If I were to have any theory what it was, um, and you know, I, you know, coming from law enforcement, you know, you deal with rock hard, solid evidence and everything. Um, some things, though, you just can't explain, or science doesn't have an answer for it yet. And I believe that there's stuff out there that we don't know about yet. During the wee hours, some interesting things were happening at the South Camp area. We were getting a lot of action around camp. And so what I started trying to, trying to feel on was when people would go out around camp, I watched their backs from a different angle to see if I could see anything sticking their head out from an area where, where some people were camping where rocks were being thrown at them every night. You know, stuff was being seen in the shadows. You know, noises were being made. And, and the second night, for instance, I heard a scream that, was, that sounded like a female, but it was four short screams, or actually four long screams, and then one short one. And other people heard it. Hopefully the audios that were out here were, were picking it up. But just little bitty odds and end things that I had heard before was starting to happen. You know, the little nuances, of, especially throwing the rocks. And I'd, I'd never had rocks thrown at me until last night when everybody went out. The whole camp was quiet. And I wanted to sit at that same spot and just observe and be quiet. And sure enough, rocks started getting thrown at us. And, and Jeff Townsend was with me. And he, he doesn't hear very well. And he even heard the rocks come in and hit stuff. And so that was kind of exciting that getting rocks thrown at me. This is kind of cool. Maybe something else will happen. Well, Jeff was looking through, I gave him the night vision and I was looking through the thermal. Well, about around midnight, I was scanning the field and, you know, Jeff and I were talking and, you know, I saw a white object, probably about 50, 60, 70 yards away, maybe. And initially I was just, okay, that wasn't there. I knew it wasn't there. So I just sat there and watched it. And then I hit record. Um, and so I was, I just didn't know. That was the whole thing. I sit there watching it and watching it, and then I would see it move. And it was like, son of a blank. It's moving. It's so, it's, 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 you know, it's got a form, it's, it's projecting heat. But I never could, I, it wasn't close enough where I could get the red off of it. Or, you know, that, that close thermal, that typical, the view that you typically see from a thermal. But it was moving. And so I told Jeff, you know, try to see it with the night vision, and he couldn't pick it up, which, you know, uh, it was like kind of whatever. I, I got it going, and it would move just a little bit, move just a little bit, and but I wasn't getting a definition. But then all of a sudden, it made a, it made about a, a 10 to 15 to 20 yard lateral move. I was like, this is it. I got it. Started to get excited, starting to get excited, and all of a sudden, boom, it just boom, took off. And with that, with that thermal, it had such a small camera face that I was looking into. I just tried to follow it the best I could. Then to the edge of the woods, it stopped. And then like two or three seconds, it was gone. So I thought I hit the mother load. I mean, I really did. I, I, I knew it wasn't a bird. It wasn't a, a feral cat or it wasn't a, it, it wasn't like a bobcat or anything like that. It was bigger. And I did see it kind of leap. So I was super excited, just, I thought I nailed it, I thought I nailed it. Well then when we were downloading it, you know, the, the kind of, it was like, you know, waiting for, to open Christmas presents. I was like, you know, you know, I was gonna do a mic drop moment, all that sort of stuff. We get it downloaded and we start watching it and I'm like, see, 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 here we are, it's moving. I go scroll to, to like minute six, cause that's when it really started moving. And hopefully we were gonna be able to figure out what it is. Well, as soon as it took off and left, it was buck. And I was just like, oh, I mean, so disappointed. I was pissed. I was really pissed. Because I thought I had it. It was a deer. And I didn't even think about a deer being out here with everybody around. You know, it's not going to come out. Nothing else was captured that night. I was, I was really pleased with how the team worked well together and as a team and we talked about decisions before we would do anything and I, I think that's really important 
that you just don't shoot from the hip. You talk to your teammates and you come up with the best solution that you can. Before we finish up, I just want to say thank you to Simone Thomas for putting up with a bunch of Bigfoot researchers and feeding us all for a week. And a big thanks to all the researchers that came together and put in the work to get this done. My hat's off to you all. Also, I do realize that some of the images are hard to see, but these creatures just don't give you very much, and there is a bit of luck involved in catching them sometimes. A huge thanks to Mark and Melanie Zasky for helping direct the teams in the field and for providing a lot of the images of the creatures they've captured on camera in this place. You can find them on Patreon at Crypto Reality. Big thanks to Cam Buckner and Nance Warren for the narrations, and be sure you check out the links in the description for all the researchers' YouTube channels. Also the book, The Florida Keys Skunk Ape Files by Brad Bertelli. Being involved in this subject as long as I have, what I've learned as much as anything is most people have a willingness to blind themselves to certain things they don't want to see or don't want to believe. Well, I'm not asking anyone to believe any of this. I'm just hoping you're aware and consider the possibility when you hear that strange howl or scream, hear hard knocking, or even feel something big is paralleling you in the woods, that it might be one of these creatures. Because believe it or not, it just might. Thank you.